Thank you for the invitation to come here to the conference. I'm very pleased. And from Andrea, I have heard the story of the Emilio Romagna region and COP2000, so I'm very honored to be invited here. It's inspiring to hear visions of the future and what we can do and what we need for the future. And we all know to make it happen, that's a different challenge. So I wanted to focus on implementation strategies and the challenges of making e-health really happen. And specifically the type of e-health infrastructures that are the inter-organizational, large interoperable networks. So not a digitization of the clinics or hospitals or the work practice, that's a different challenge. But these large scale networks they come with some specific challenges. One need to involve actors outside of one's own organization. So you cannot decide. You need to convince people to join. They have different interests. So you'll need to negotiate and find a pragmatic balance. There will be many, and that's the challenge to organize and coordinate action with many actors. And maybe most importantly, there is a dilemma which sociologists call collective action dilemmas. What is rational for me or for my organization does not match what is rational for the collective. I, if I invest, if my organization invests in this project, someone else will get the benefits. So that's kind of dilemmas are core to inter to e-health projects. And I think we should look at our strategies and ask how well do they address this challenge. There are top-down strategies, bottom-up, middle-out, a variety. Let's examine, can they, can they deal with this challenge? So I, my argument here today is, is quite simple. I say that these different strategies have different demands on how much coordination do they need? What will they require? And also, this is a, maybe a repetition of Ule's point, the connection between the architecture of the solution and the demand for coordination in the network. So you saw one of the examples of Ule uh, in the previous talk, um, where you had an architecture or a project where all the actors needed to give their components, their part, before the whole solution would work. And the story from Norway is that one of these parties did not, did not follow the schedule, did not deliver the components, so the system could not work. It's a very vulnerable, very high risk type of strategy. When benefits come only in the end, only when everything is there, and when benefits come not for each step in the process. These are two core challenges of many strategies. And I want to share with you two empirical examples from Denmark. Um, it is from a paper written with a Danish colleague, Tina Jensen, from Copenhagen Business School. We compare two very different projects, almost not comparable, <laughs> but they are one government project uh, ambitious, with a lot of funding and strong political support that failed. And we compare it with a small project starting between two hospitals and then spreading to more hospitals and becoming a national standard. Uh, it is, um, this Sunhed.deco is the, the patient portal of Denmark. It's been for many years and you've probably heard of it as a, one of the first citizen portals. The one service there of the e-record comes from these small projects. And I think the success has to do with how they mobilized stakeholders. Denmark had early strategic incentives to create EPRs. And by the end of the 90s, they had a number of simple EPR systems in hospitals. But free text, not structured data, not interoperable. There were many things that they wanted to improve. So the government decided we need a second generation EPR. 
and as the government, we will define the national standard, the basic structure for EPR, an information model. It should be structured, it should support a problem or diagnosis oriented record. It should give process support, not just this passive document repository. And it should enable cross-disciplinary collaboration. The structured data required that they translate a terminology. They choose to translate the SNOMED CT. The process support, they wanted to create a new patient registry, a national registry, where you could follow from the GP, local hospital specialist, and back and forth to, to get data. This, this, of course, required a new information model, new EPR systems. It was a radical, radically different change. So the government employed clinicians and software engineers, and they had strong backing, and it, it, the national strategy says, this is the national standard. This is supposed to be implemented for municipalities, for GPs, for nursing homes, for hospitals, everyone across the country by January 1st, 2006. And they started to define this um, information model. After two years, there was a version one and some updates um, in the year after was tested in pilots. These were not full-scale functional pilots. They tested some aspects of this model in, uh, an, in three hospitals. And the use was discontinued. It was not like mature enough to use. And I think after this testing, um, the vendors lost a bit of trust in the project. It was too slow, it was too complex, too radical. But the standardization continued. And in 2004 came version two there was, uh, yeah, later in 2004, a public hearing. And in that process, the first official criticism came to the model, saying it's too complex, it's unrealistic. They did not want to hear this critique, and they, they continued standardization. And there is a version from August 2005, version 2.2, which is the um, um, official standard. And that's, nothing more happened. No, no vendor believed enough to, to work on this, uh, to work with product development on this. But this could not really be admitted until 2007, 2008, that this project had died. There was so much prestige in the project. And in 2007, an independent company said, there is no, nothing has happened since the pilots, nobody are developing. Um, the healthcare actors doesn't want this, they don't believe in this. So, and this translation of the SNOMED uh, terminology, it didn't take two years as expected, it would take even many more years. So after a while this stopped. And looking at the project, I would say they maximized the complexity. They made a system along all dimensions. The, the number of actors, they took everyone at all levels across the whole of Denmark. On the functional scope, yes, this was a complete system to cover all kinds of needs in the healthcare sector. And also on the ambition of radical change in a short time. So all of these things contributed to complexity. The story of this other project is very different. It's called, the, the acronym is, stands for Standardized Extraction of Patient Data. It's a simple solution where around 20 data elements from patient record are extracted and put in a database. And others can view this data in the database. So simple web, web technology. Um, this was made for hospitals who had a practical problem, like from one delivery ward, if a baby was born and there was a problem, they would be transferred to a pediatric unit or an obstetric unit in a nearby hospital. And the problem was the transfer of information together with the patient. So this department got a pilot of this very simple solution. So when a patient was transferred, they would extract from the EPR, put in the database, and the other could read. 
and another pilot also for heart, heart surgery patients. And after a month of piloting, this department didn't want to give it up. They, they continued to use it. Other hospitals heard of this. It was spread, it was implemented. After it, a while, it grew enough that you had to put in place a bit more administrative structure. And this entity called Medcom created some more, yeah, they maintained the registries, they updated the standard and they coordinated purchase and contracts and all of this. This expanded geographically to the areas of Denmark. They expanded the functionality so citizens could look in, GPs could look in. And then by 2009, this had become a de facto interoperable EPR system for Denmark. Very simple, there are many things it cannot do, but there is, there is a system where you can access the records of most things. And compared to the first project, here they minimized complexity. They did not require a change in the documentation practices or registration, no new systems. The vendors did not have to take big risks, just a module. They did not need a structured terminology and they didn't have any couplings. And I think the second part, the allowed a decoupled implementation is also an important component. You did not depend on many others before you could start using this. It was a, two, yeah, the first, first pilots were one, two hospitals collaborating, so not many actors. Generic functionality, and you had a problem that got a solution immediately. So little coordination was needed for this spreading and scaling. And if, if we look at what I claim to be the core challenge for e-health, we have the, tradi the academic tradition, the, the research stream that we come from is this infrastructure studies, information infrastructure studies. We have a number of kind of recommendations saying, think about cultivation, not construction. Think about a way of approaching problems that do not assume you have full control. Work with unsecurity, depend on negotiation, allow for learning and adaptation. And bootstrapping, all, all also talked about bootstrapping. Exploit what you've got, don't plan off something you haven't got yet. But I think also this about coordination, we should think about how strategies should deal with this. And in that paper, we talk about modularity as a way to think about this. A modular architecture allows for modular implementation. So if this core challenge relates to the organizing and coordinating of actors in the situation where there is the social, um, the collective action dilemmas, then modular architectures that allow modular implementation could be beneficial. They demand less coordination, they demand less organization of the stakeholders. They give direct usefulness, can be generic reusable solutions, and yeah, more simple implementation strategies. So if, the, if there are software engineers here, you for sure have heard of the principle of encapsulation. When you design a module, when you design a software, you put modules. And the module should have high cohesion and low coupling. Within the module, most of the processing happens within the module and minimal processing goes out of the module. So minimize the dependency. And I suggest we take um, transport that into strategy thinking and think what is the minimal unit of implementation. Let's find a kind of entity or piece of, of functionality that connects as closely as prob possible the problem and the solution. If you invest, you, s you solve a problem, both in terms of for each actor, but also temporally. If you invest something, there is not many years until you get the benefits. So tight coupling of problem solution, investment benefit, and low coupling to minimize dependency on the other components. So that's, I think, about generic advice, how can we think about implementation strategies? I think this is important if we want to see the e-health 
potentialities realized. And of course, if you are powerful, if you have much resources, you can have more ambitious units of implementation. That's for sure. Thank you.